I mean, we could have joy development a bit for our opening sessions of Daniel, you rascal. That was very good. God bless you. Thank you. Arthur Gossip, Scott's fella, died in the early 1900s, right? Close to the beginning. He was the teacher, professor, teacher, mentor of a more, um, well, more famous, maybe, of um, William Barclay. He had a friend who was blind, blind all of his life. Every now and again, he would take his friend out. This is his story. This is gossip telling us about the occasion, okay? So he took him out, say, the big city, took him up into the hills, as was characteristic of them. And he said, um, it was a glorious day, a glorious day. He said, the sky was never bluer. Any clouds that there were, were big fluffy things that, you know, just all that curving and all of that moving and the slow looking down like, are you looking at us, you know, you see how wonderful we are kind of thing. He said, of course, there were birds and they were enjoying themselves, aerial gymnastics and all of that. And he said it was a lake down there. Every now and again, behind the, the, the clouds and that, it looked like this and that. And then when the sun came out, that little lake became copper, burnished copper or gold. Just there it was. He said it was an extra ordinary day. And he said, three feet away from me, sat a man who was not able to see all of that. Now there's a tragedy, eh? Not the biggest tragedy in life that so many have been subjected to, but nevertheless, all of that glory and no vision to see it. Which leads me uh, to what Joy said without going into it, but there is this dream you, you, you heard how frequently he said, God give us dreams and that kind of thing. Um, if you don't have vision, the capacity for imagining, if you don't have the capacity for thinking, well, maybe poetic is the right word, but, but poets do that for us. They not only give us a, a new way of looking at something, they give us speech, utterance, that we can use to speak a hidden uh, thing in it that we who are more prosaic, we don't get it. But dear God, some poets really do it for us. Or, or if it's not a poem, it's a, a book, yeah? Uh, or, a, or a movie that is really worthwhile. An incident and an otherwise mediocre movie. A single incident can really get a hold of you. And uh, you think bigger, lovelier. I'm talking about that which is uh, lovely rather than that which is appalling, yes? Though that can happen too, as you know. Um, it's vision that we uh, need. Yeah. And the one who is the vision maker, above all vision makers, is the one that you have, if you are indeed a Christian, and we are here, yeah. But if you commit your uh, life to him, all kinds of possibilities are open that are not open uh, to people 
who are radically empiricist people, the, the, who judge everything by the five senses. And the five senses are, are, are great. I mean, they're indispensable and all of that kind of thing. But beyond all of these things, and behind all of these things are not only the unholy powers that uh, Joy reminded us of, behind all of the visual and the sight issues, that we are glad when we see them, happy to have physical people around us that we can touch and talk to, hear them breathe and all of that. And all of these are fine and lovely things that we won't apologize for enjoying. Yeah? But beyond all of that, and this is your faith I'm speaking, and it's your faith I'm speaking because it's the biblical witness. Behind all of that is a God who came to us in and through and as Jesus of Nazareth. So that when you look at him, Jesus will say in a number of different places with different little phrasing, those that have seen me have seen him that sent me. Take a look at me. He said, have a good look. What do you see in me? Yeah. What you see in me, you see in the Holy Father. Now, because he's a single human being, Jesus of Nazareth, I mean, Jesus was a human being. He wasn't just humanity, though he stands for, in a number of important, critically important texts, he stands for humankind. But he himself is a specific person. And even though his life was what you and I believe it to be and more, he himself said in John 14, uh, verse 28, last phrase, he said, well, he says in 1429, 28, 29, he said, I told you that I was going to the Father. And if you love me, and he doesn't mean F, F, A. No, if you love me, you will be glad. Why would they be glad? Because he's going to the Father. He said, because the Father is greater than I am. God in Jesus Christ is not being God. He's not God being God. He's God being a man. And that man, the most glorious man that ever lived on this planet, said, you think I'm great? <laughs> Wait till you meet my father. <sighs> you know what? What about it? When you hear me teach, he says, you hear me teach only what my father has taught me and what I have learned from him. I'm not giving you texts. They're all over the place. You're acquainted with them anyway. John chapter 5 is a great read. The whole chapter, when you get a chance sometime, read it. He said, I don't do anything but what the father helps me do. I don't say anything but what the father helps me teach. I don't think anything that the father helps me think. He's not, he's not a, um, a robot or a doll or anything like that, but he says, my relationship with him is so close. And whatever I think, he thinks. Whatever he says, I end up saying it. Whatever he says, why don't you do that? I end up doing it. Yeah. Jesus said, see me, and you see God. How much? How much of God do you see? Well, quantitatively, he, Jesus wasn't omniscient. I mean, he'd ask uh, for things. And he would say, oh, I don't know what that judgment's coming on uh, Jerusalem in particular, but my father does, but I don't know. So he, he's not omniscient. 
nor is he omnipresent. He has to walk his way to Galilee and he has to, you know what I mean. He's not omniscient, he's not omnipresent. And at that case, he's not all powerful. The power he says he exercises, he gets from the Holy Father. So we're not talking quantitatively when we say that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1, verse 15. No, no, it's qualitatively. What kind of God is it that you people worship? What kind of God is he? Well, he's fierce against wickedness. And anything, anything that is a harm to you, he said it will be rooted up. Now that's fierce work of his. I'll root it up, he said. Why will he root up? Any plant, he says, which my heavenly Father has not planted. Will be rooted up. Mm -hmm. In the end, 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter, you know. In 1 Corinthians 15, in the end, he will reign in the midst of his enemies until that point when the victory is complete and the last enemy, which is death, is destroyed. Mm -hmm. then as he speaks, he is exercising power and he works miracles, all of that you know. But he made it very clear. He made it very clear. And Peter will say it in Acts chapter 10. Anytime Christ worked a miracle, he was not working a miracle from inherent power. He was a man. And men don't have that inherent power. The Spirit of God anointed him. And he was able to heal all these people because God was with him. Yeah? What kind of a God is it that qualitatively the Lord Jesus has been manifesting? in fullness, qualitatively. What if it was a piece of God that we didn't know anything about? We couldn't be sure. Well, you know, you can have a bad temper, you know, that kind of thing. Or you can look at some people and get so fed up with them, you know. Mm. That's not the case. Jesus says, I am the image of the invisible God. Look at me. When you look at me and you see me, hear what I say and all of that, when I'm opposed to injustice, when I get angry at people who, instead of helping people with religion, with truth about God and all of that, they bind on them burdens, grievous to be born. He said, that makes me angry. When I come in and I see divisions made between Gentiles and women and the big hitters in there and they've made the temple of God which is to be a place for prayer for everybody, it makes me mad and he throws over the table and he does what he does. He said, when you see my response to injustice, you're seeing how my father feels about it. Uh -huh. But, but, the thing that I think we don't speak enough about or think enough about, reflect on enough about before we speak about it, that God is a happy God. Well, I happy God. Marcus Dodds, who died in the mid-19th century, he said, I don't believe that Jesus ever laughed. I, I think he's wrong, but 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 still, uh, it was a world so seriously in trouble, and Christ saw so much bad stuff going on, and there were times when he was angry, and he saw people who were poor and hurting and all of that. It had to be a serious life, and it was serious. But I can't believe, I can't. Believe, I like to imagine that Christ is sitting with the, that apostolic group there, and he. When nobody's looking, he picks up a stone and he whacks 
Peter in the back of the head with it. You know, and then looks up around, you know. That. I choose to believe that. I don't have a verse against it, so I'm choosing to believe it, all right? I think Christ rejoiced. And I know that's true because I hear him say to the apostolic group, I want you to have fullness of joy. I want my joy to be yours. So I know he rejoiced. But, but to say that God is happy, it's a little bit of a different angle. But it's just as true. Christ is teaching people about God in Luke 15. The people that are hanging around him are the moral riffraff according to the Pharisees and that. They were the, 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 you know, the very, they weren't all like this. There were some really fine men uh, who were Pharisees. But characteristically, they were upright, law-abiding, all of that kind of thing. But when they had a Bible study and Jesus was teaching out there in the open and they had uh, a Bible study going on in the synagogue. You can rest assured, they had hardly anybody in there. And the people were right on the mountainside listening to Jesus. Why, why is that? Why is that? Upright, strong, upright people. And, and I'm serious about there being up, up, upright, you understand? But the people who are strong and upright, they're not very drawing, uh, you know, whatever you think of a Pharisee, and they're not all bad, they're not all bad. Matthew 23 is the most fierce piece of scripture I've known to me in the whole of the Bible. And he's talking about the Pharisees. You sons of Gehenna, how can you escape? You do this and that and the, and the, and the Outlines uh, their characteristic way, but that's not how his speech ends in Matthew 23. It ends with us, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it kills the prophets and stones them that come unto you. How often I would have gathered you like a hand gathers her chickens under her wings, and you wouldn't do it. So for all his fierce speech, he loved the, and I like how uh, Joy made the point, the judgment and the love of God. They're, they're, they're not opponents at all. They're aspects of the central loving character of God. So sometimes judgment is needed. Yeah. So, so here is God. Here is God, the creator, the, the majestic one and all of that. And he's not a God that we can go about singing romantic ballads about all the time. There's too much scripture that makes it clear he opposes those that hurt, unrepentantly hurt and are abusive, who steal from who rape and plunder and humiliate people, whole nations being buried by such people. Yeah, so he's fierce. But Jesus is telling about God in Luke chapter 15. It says all the publicans and sinners were there with him. And the scribes, the text says, and the scribes and the Pharisees murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners, eats with them. Good grief. Well, what was their problem? He thinks he's a holy man. If he were a holy man, what would he do? He'd hang around the holy people. And he's not hanging around us. He's hanging around a riffraff. They called him a mob in John 7. So, the word gets to Jesus. This is what they're saying. So he tells several stories. And it's critically important to get, uh, I judge it to be critically important. You do your own. Think of this. It's, it's not just that God is nice and kind and all, and he is all of those things. But God's friends, 
God's friends should feel about things as he feels about things. That's what life, that's what life says to us as well. Here's this woman, she loses the coin and there's, there's nice conversation, the fellows who spend time in that, about the nature of the coin, it was a part of a this, that, and you know, they're shelving that. She finds it, she loses a coin and it's very precious to her. Out comes the broom or whatever, and she absolutely goes through that house until she finds it. And the first thing she does, she goes looking for her friends. The Greek text has her female friends. Makes perfect sense in the great story that he told. She goes to her friends and she said, take a look at this. <laughs> I found it. And she says, rejoice with me, for I have found what is lost. And then the shepherd, 77, 78, 97, 99, where's the other one? They would have a rod at the gate. And they all knew there was time to go in and settle down, and they all go in, and he'd hold the rod down that kind of trapped them so he can count them. And uh, he was counting them, but there's one missing. So he goes searching for him, and he finds, he finds it and comes back, and he calls, first thing he does, he calls his friends, and he says, Rejoice with me. I have found it. You should have seen him. Find him down in the ravine. You know, such and such. You know, yeah, yeah. And he was sitting there, my, what did his mommy and all that. And dead was he glad to see me. I picked him up, put him on my shoulder, and he snuggled into me in here. <laughs> and then a great story. And here he gets him and he says to them, rejoice with me. 99, I was very happy about it, but I was broken hearted about number 100 because I knew how number 100 would be feeling. And then the story of the father and the boys that we won't uh, repeat. It's too, too good a story, too well known. And at the conclusion of it, when the older brother, he wouldn't come in. Big bottle of lip, you know. And he was absolutely hacked off. Now this guy, and he, and he had him right, you understand? He saw him for what he was. This, this young man, Jesus doesn't make the prodigal into a sweet kid who just happened to lose his way. This kid came up and said, I want what is coming to me, which, you know, could have been dangerous. But he walked up and said, I want what's coming to me. And the father let him have it. And away he went. And he spent it all in all kinds of this stuff and the other. And the story must have gotten back home in that because he knew what he had been up to. So now he says, that guy... This, 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 he did this, and did that, and did the other, and I will not go in there and celebrate him or his being home. I won't do it. And the father said, he's your brother. And it's only right that we should rejoice. And all of that? All of that was about God. <laughs> and here comes Jesus with a sheep on his shoulder. And he is God bringing home some poor thing that under the circumstances, what, what, what are the circumstances? How come there are Christians and non-Christians? How come there are atheists and non-atheists? Uh, they, they don't, you know, they don't fall down out of the sky. They're not that way when they come out of the womb. What is it that leads people to all these different uh, sets of circumstances and ending up with their convictions and their feelings? How is that? Life, life's not the same for everyone. 
And mine are those who are unrepentant and vicious, brutal, heartless in what they're doing, who knew exactly what they're doing. And you can think now of, of drug cartel. Just, just think of all of that. Just men let it go by. You know, there's a difference between people who they've had hard times and they're, and they're bitter and all of that. It goes on. And Jesus knows that. And when someone asks him, how come they don't all believe in you? And he tells us the story of the sower. Well, you know, uh, some don't get to hear it, really. And then some get it, but they're in the midst of the cares of life and all of that. Some soil's not great. But he doesn't go into, but he expects you and me to go into the idea, well, well did they invent the soil? Did, did, did they grow up the thorns and all that they were stuck in? Jesus doesn't hack people except those who have the power and exercise it unrepentantly and heartlessly for the judgment. But here he comes with this lamb, this person, this man, woman, boy or girl who's been shaped in life by an ugly home. Not excusing evil ever. Evil is always evil. But people, Christians, we're told in Ephesians 6 verse 10, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and invisible realms. You, you, you sitting here, you do that. You, you do that. You fight against all of that. You, you, you don't have to know it. You don't have to feel it as we were reminded. It's not a sight issue. It's not a feeling issue. It's a faith issue here. But but it's true. And you're doing it. What do, what do they do? The non-Christian people? What do, who, what do they fight against? Don't they? Don't they have trouble too? Don't they have circumstances and people who are calling them and seducing them into wickedness and all of that? Believe this. Think noble thoughts of God. For when the judgment comes, Acts 20, 31 says, that the day is coming when God will judge the world in righteousness. See that word? Dakusune. It's, it's a juridical term. But a word means what a speaker or a writer means it to mean. And all those big words, all those big words have not only a denotation, they connote, they generate visions, sets of circumstances, all of that. When God judges this world, the judge of all the earth will do what is right. And as Frankie likes to say, he did what was right, he does what was right, and he will always do what is right. So, think noble thoughts of God. Yeah? And then, last word, and I'll leave you alone. Here's Christ. He is telling us God. He is exhibiting God. He is modeling God. He models them. Look at me, he says to the apostolic group of 14. Have I been so long with you? You haven't seen me? If you've seen me, seen me. Poetry, the imagery, the, the, the speech. That if you think, oh, I don't know. That's a great phrase. And that new phrase that somebody has introduced you to makes God look better, bigger. You can't really make him bigger or better. But, but still, in your view, in your vision, he gets bigger. Jesus is gone, coming home with his sheep. And what does he say? First thing, goes to his friends and he says, rejoice with rejoice with rejoice along 
with me. I found what was lost. What does that tell you? God loves it. <laughs> when he sees somebody coming home, when he sees something lovely done, he rejoices. And he would say to you, and you don't audibly hear him, but you hear him. Him saying, rejoice along with me, for I am uh, thrilled. People worry about anthropopathism. Well, I don't know that God's got human feelings. Oh, never mind all of that. God came in and asked Jesus Christ, and he said, I feel things. I rejoice. I'm saddened. I get where I weep and all of that. That kind of thing. And when God sees someone coming home, what's coming home is not trash, not junk. For God, our God, doesn't, did not bleed for worms. Who he is, is beyond our speech. What he thinks of you is sometimes it takes some believing, but we believe it. We believe it because he, Jesus said, you trust the Father. Trust me. I'm telling you that's how it is. And it's that. It's that that you believe. It's that which you live for. It's that what you will die believing, praise God. And these gatherings here bear witness to invisible beings. Ephesians 3.10. Good, good people, good beings, I mean, and evil beings. And right this minute, there are ugly, invisible powers seeing all of what is going on here, hearing all this singing, this praying, this teaching, and just the physicality of this gathering. <clears throat> I know it's bad ones. They worry. You can feel the walls of pandemonium shaking and trembling, and they know their time's coming. Yeah. <clears throat> Holy Father, uh, what? What to say? What to say? Uh, we're saying that we love you. And I suppose each of us, when we say that to you, uh, wonders just how, what we're doing. Hopefully. Not all of us, but this we know. This we know. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere we want to go. And in our aspects of, us, of unbelief, we commit those to you for healing and ask you, heal, heal our unbelief. And in our moments of bitterness, in our moments of don't want to be bothered, and we won't forgive and, and won't credit and, and want, want what we want and all of that, and this leaves us sorrowful at times, and we kick all of that that we're not happy about, mm -hmm. and all of that that we're very happy about. And we give them all to you and ask for ongoing healing and ask you to believe, for we mean it as much as is possible in us. I ask you to believe that we're grateful and thankful for who you are and what you've made us to believe that we are, each one as we look at one another. You are helping us to believe what we really are in your sight. And your sight alone matters. And we thank you all of that, for all of that, in the name of the blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.